they'd be naysayers. You know, they would say, no, it's you're too, you haven't got enough work experience yet. You know, get a job and then maybe in the future. But, uh, you know, in, in some respects, that, that kind of made me a bit more determined, you know, prove, proving people wrong. I think I think there'll always be people who will want to guide you in a different direction. But if you think it's right, you know, you've got to you've got to you've got to go with your gut. Welcome to the passion behind the art show. It's all about diving in with individuals to learn the story behind their passion. It's your host, Daryl Pinna. Well, I'm super excited to have David Ari on the Passion Band the Art Show. I'm a well-known designer. Um, he's pretty well-known in the creative community, and I'm excited to have him all the way from Belfast. David, welcome. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Definitely, definitely. So let's jump right into it. How did David's journey start in the creative world? <laughs> I was at the age of about 15 when I started at a local college. It was a, an art and design course. And yeah, through that, I did classes like, well, on the art side, there was life drawing. On the design side, it was things like logos. And that's where the logo, the logo fascination kind of started for me. And I stayed at that college for two years on that course and then progressed for another two years um, to do a kind of a higher level of education. The same, the same course, art and design, but with more of a uh, focus on graphic design. Mm-hmm. And from there, it, after that, it was either a case of get a job or move to Scotland to go to university. And the, the, the latter was the easy choice, although it took a bit of persuading my parents because they were, they were such a good help when it came to that. You know, I had to have a part time job at the same time, but they helped me with you know, finances. And so I was very fortunate in that respect. And yeah, in Scotland, I spent three years at university and um, yeah, I, I had the opportunity to go to the States for an internship mm. during the course, which was brilliant. And yeah, I, I stayed in Scotland for another seven years after that before eventually, well, part of that was starting up my own business because um, I worked for a, a cancer charity for a couple of years as their graphic designer and web specialist. Um, and then I, I left to do a bit of travel and when I came back they hadn't filled my role so I pitched the idea of becoming a, a contractor in essence for them you know doing my old job but right. be invoicing them at the end of each month and so they became my first retainer client which was massive in the step to independent being an independent designer you know it gave me that bit of security for three days a week until right. I could kind of build my, my own client base so I'm curious well, it's something you just said so how did you go about doing that pitch to them when you um, pitched um, becoming a contractor when I was working for them there was a period of time when I was injured through uh, a football injury and I got to do my job from home and it, it occurred to me then that I could always do the same job from home and, mm-hmm. and they well my boss at the time didn't like the idea of me working remotely, but it's what I kind of preferred because it gave me a bit more freedom in my hours and just getting the work done essentially. So when I was left, when I had left to go traveling, I, I came back and well, I just asked them. And it was a thought that I had in my mind, and I just asked them. It was okay. as simple as that. Oh, okay. And thankfully, thankfully, yeah, my my role hadn't been filled, and. Yeah, I could I could do the same job until until they grew to a stage where they needed to hire someone full time. And as I didn't want to be a, a full time designer for them, then yeah, that that kind of ended. But thankfully, by that stage, you know, I I got a few clients of my own, and you know, my, my own business started to grow. Okay, cool. So, where did this thought? Uh... Did it all just come because you were working from home, the idea of just kind of running your own thing? Kind of, kind of. Um, well, my my dad is, is self-employed. He was, he's been self-employed since he was um, about 20. He um, he started up his own car garage, you know, where he, where he sells tires, does wheel alignments, fix, fixes punctures, that type of thing. So I guess his kind of... 
his road in the business kind of rubbed off on me a bit. You know, I, I grew up seeing him working for himself, so that probably played, played a part. Okay, cool, cool. So how did this whole fascination, because graphic design is like this umbrella and there's like a whole bunch of different notches underneath it. How did the whole fascination for logos come about? I think it's because you, once you get it done, you can you can work with so many different clients. You know, it's not always the same thing. Whereas if you're if you're developing a, a, a website, for example, and your job with the client means that that constantly needs to be updated and refined, mm -hmm. it's always the same thing. Um, whereas with logos, yeah, I, some of my projects last three weeks, some of them last three months. Um, the longest might have been nine months or a year, but that's rare. So I get to learn from a lot of different clients. I get to learn from a lot of different professions. It keeps it interesting for me. And at the same time, I get to sketch. You know, there aren't very many right, jobs right. where you get to pick up a pen or a pencil. You know, and, and you're, you're getting paid for, for sitting doodling. And it doesn't matter where you do it. You can be on a bus. You can be, I don't know, in a cafe. So, yeah, there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of fun in the job. And I know how rare that is. Mm, no, it makes sense. Yes, that is the truth. You get to sketch because sometimes, you know, we lose the the need or just the opportunity to just get pen and paper, pen and paper. It's just always on the computer. So yeah, that does make a lot of sense. A lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So during this process, um, what would you say was like the hardest point for you from, from stage from when you first started till now? There were more challenges when I started because I really had no business skills. I made the jump from employment into self-employment without any kind of mentor or when I was studying, there wasn't a lot, of, there wasn't anything really about starting your own business. So I made a lot of mistakes in terms of wasting time with people who wanted something for nothing. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I, I would go to, I would arrange meetings. I wouldn't pre-qualify my clients like I would now. So I'd be turning up to meetings and I'd be spending half an hour, an hour, um, an hour and a half talking to someone, and then it might be another hour of travel. And then at the end, you know, we'll, we'll carry on a bit of emails, a bit of calls on the phone, and ultimately it leads to nothing um, because probably they wanted to spend, you know, 50 pounds or 100 pounds. Um, yeah, and if I had just asked at the start or told them uh, a minimum rate, you know, it could have ruled out a lot of wasted time. So that was, that was one of the challenges it took me it took me a year or two to kind of figure things out for myself in, ter you know, in terms of being more reliable with the people that I want to work with. Oh, okay. So if you, how you, do you currently go about doing that, like kind of being able to vet your clients and stuff like that? How do you currently go about doing that? Well, generally, I'll get an email from people before I talk on the phone. And... Sometimes they'll ask straight up, you know, how much do you charge? And, and then I will tell them something like, my previous clients have valued my work between this and this. Is that in line with your budget? And probably nine times out of 10, it won't be. So, so that's, that's why it makes sense just to get it, rid of, get, get it over with at the start. You know, you can't spend too long dealing with people who don't have your budget you just gotta you, you've got to talk about it straight away otherwise you'll never get any work done you know it's funny you say that sometimes you know i don't know where we got it from but at some point like for designers we thought like talking about the money aspect was like the very last thing and it actually shouldn't be it should the earlier you the earlier and the more often you talk about that the better off, the better off you'll be. <laughs> I think it's I think it's a a very common mistake, Daryl. Um, it's it's how I started. I would be afraid to talk about money. I I didn't want to scare people off, but you know it's it's no it's it's not a good way to do business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that idea of the of what you like discussing or what previous clients have, and even the way how you put it. 
your previous clients and value you do at this and this rate. I like that. I like that um way of putting it because um, then, you know, it kind of one, it gets the conversation out the way early and two, it gives them an idea of what people have actually, not just this pie in the sky that you've made up, but what people have actually paid you to. Yeah. To, to, to pay you to do work for so who would you say you kind of like um th- the people that's in david's life that kind of like, give him support because as we know like trying to do something on your own is very difficult and if you don't have some kind of passion for it you will literally go crazy so who would you say are those people that kind of bring you through when it's rough or when it's just stressful or just you just get support from well i'm i'm, I'm lucky that i've got a a good family around me and they all kind of live close by too which is which is great and when i started in business some of my friends they'd be naysayers you know they would say no it's you're too you haven't got enough work experience yet you know get a job and then maybe in the future but uh you know it, in some respects that that kind of made me a bit more determined you know <laughs> pro- proving people wrong i think i think there'll always be people who will want to guide you in a different direction but if you think it's right you know you've got to you've got to you've got to go with your gut and if you if you, it's the job you really want to do then you know yeah i, I agree it's, it's hard to be being being independent as well yeah it is it is but some people are just kind of driven that direction and there's nothing you could do or say to change that nothing so now you're more established doing your thing um what is like the first hour of david's day like oh it's it's not it's not very exciting <laughs> <laughs> it's it's probably similar to, to most people say so, you know I'll, I'll get up i'll i'll have breakfast I'll, I'll have a shower and you know it's probably about half an hour 45 minutes before i would be either sitting down at my desk and setting setting out the things that I have to do or you know some mornings I, I might I might have a, a half hour workout before before mm-hmm. sitting at my desk and if if I don't if I don't get some exercise before starting work then I'll generally take a break during the day because spending too long at the desk I, I just it just gives me headaches you know I, I, that's one of the things I've been suffering with um, almost since I started in self-employment was chronic headaches Oh. So yeah, well, uh, yeah, I know it's not good to be sitting at uh, at a desk all the time. You got to get up, move around, and it's, yeah, it, it helps a lot. It's funny you said that. I do struggle with that also. Uh-huh. I, yeah, I'm not sure if it's because I'm at a desk, but I will constantly like I constantly have headaches. Yeah, it's really common, and you don't. It can be debilitating at times. You know, there are some days when it gets so bad that I would just have to lie down in a dark room right. and, and hope that two hours, three hours later, it goes away. I'm feeling a bit, but yeah, right. yeah. I, I've, I've gone to so many doctor's appointments over the years. You know, one of the most extreme treatments that I tried was uh, Botox injections, and that was on the <laughs> NHS. It sounds crazy, and it's, yeah, and I was wary of it, but what they did was they gave me 21 injections around my head wow you know from here and down the back and, and into the neck and it apparently works for about 40 percent of the people that it's tried on all right but with me uh no i, I think <laughs> halfway through it took about half an hour and uh, i said no i'm getting really lightheaded here and they put you in one of these beds that kind of swivels up you know as if you're giving blood so i had to just spend <laughs> Spent five minutes lying there waiting for the next half session of these injections. Uh, it's not recommended. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow, that is insane. Wow. But yeah, I yeah. go through the same thing. Uh, my wife and my, my mom, they're like, there's something not right. But uh, yeah, I'm constantly, it's like at least. Sometimes, most of the times, it's at least once a week. Sometimes, multiple times for the week. Mhm, mhm. Yeah, it's yeah. tough. It's tough. I feel for you. Yeah, crazy. So, uh, what would you have? Any book recommendations? Good books that have helped you. There's a fairly recent one um, written by Michael Johnson. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Bolt Branding is the title. I was just looking on my on my my bookshelf there. The spine says Michael Johnson Branding. 
Um, but it's I think the, the longer title is Branding and Five and a Half Steps. And yeah, he he's one of the guys that that he's one of the most reputable, knowledgeable designers in the profession. He he works, you know, Johnson Banks is his firm in London. And I think he, he spent two or three years putting this book together. Um, and it's, it's fantastic. Uh, the the knowledge, the content in there is brilliant. So it's one of those ones where I've I've read it, but I could read it 10 times and still not remember everything that he, he's, he's advising because there's so much, you know, from, from naming to putting together a solid identity. Um, yeah. I highly recommend picking it up. Yeah, I've heard of it. I'm definitely going to try it out now. So <clears throat> what is next? What is next for David? You've conquered the world. What's next for oh. David? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know about that, but thank you. Uh, well, I've, I've, I'm just putting the finishing touches to my next book. Mm, cool. And that's at the stage where all the content is written and it's edited and it's being proofread and final changes are being made. So my publisher, Rockport in the States, have been fantastic. And they, the last thing that they did was to send me a PDF of all the spreads. So I went through the PDF and marked up any changes that I needed that needed made, anything from a, a content or a design viewpoint. Because I, I designed the book as well. But it, and things got a bit hectic for me in the summer. And I ran over the deadline, so they suggested passing the InDesign files to them. And then whenever the the chapters were edited, they would put the edited content back in. Mm. So it's just little things like making sure that you know that one page might have two columns of text and just bumping down you know a word here and there. Right, you know, right. It, it's kind of it's fussy, but it, it makes the difference. And that's where that's the stage where we're at. So I've got to find out. Who wants to review you review the book and get their addresses, send all the addresses to my publisher. They'll as soon as it's printed, then my publisher will send out all the review copies. So it's at the stage of yeah, final tweaks and figuring out how to best promote it. Okay, cool. So um how many books have you worked on before? Two. There are two titles. One of them is in a second edition. Mm -hmm. which was kind of 50% different from the first edition. Mm -hmm. So two and a half books, and this is this is my third. And what, do you want to talk a little bit what they were about? Well, the first one was Logo Design Love, named after uh, my, my blog of the same name. And that's essentially about what it takes to create a good logo. And there's bits in there about dealing with clients, about staying motivated, um, uh, a few other things. And my, my second book, Work for Money, Design for Love, is more about the business side of being a designer, being an independent designer. Because, yeah, my publisher came back to me after the success of the first book and asked, so what's your next book? And I'm trying to figure out, well, what, what do I know about? Um, <laughs> I, I've written I've written everything I know about, about logos. Um, well, right, I might, have, I might have learned a few more things in, in, since it was published, but, but not enough to write another book. So... Well, I think this maybe they suggested it along the line somewhere. Well, what about being, you know, what about the business of design? Mm. But even then, I didn't think that I had enough to fill a whole fill a book. So okay. I brought on board a lot of other people. You know, I asked okay. for advice from others as well, which which makes the book more valuable because there's only so much that I can tell people. Right. And it kind of backs up what I've done whenever other people are having you know similar experiences. Oh, that's cool. It's funny how you just said logo, <laughs> logo love so, uh, so logo design love <laughs> so casually. <laughs> like that's one of the most popular logo books out there. <laughs> it's for a, for a design book. It's, yeah, it's done. It's done all right. <laughs> writing writing about design is never going to make you rich, but if you, can, <laughs> you know, if you can get it out there in a few different languages, it's it's good. Yeah, but I mean, it does, you know, it does create a sense of authority in the industry. And, you know, one of the most books you see everywhere is that book. I think almost everybody has one of those books. So it's not it's not too bad. That's good, That's good to know. I appreciate that. I'm hoping I'm hoping this next one is uh, 
is is better because I think it will be better because yeah I'm excited about it uh, the the what it is essentially it's called identity designed uh, or ID named after another blog of mine and uh, I brought on board 16 design studios from around the world mm. design studios that I respect that put out some amazing work and I interviewed each of them about how they do what they do from mm finding their clients to invoicing to um, generating ideas to presenting their work to reaching consensus with the client to persuading on the right option um, right through to copywriting their designs or or trademarking sorry um, and what they do after sign off measuring success as well and each studio has maybe 20 pages in the book where they focus on one of their best projects as well as talking through their process in general. And there's a lot of similarities, but there are also a lot of differences. So it, it, it made me realize that there's no one right way to do our job. And if it works for you, brilliant. At the same time, there can be a lot of ways to improve on what you do. And, I, and there are a lot of ways that I'm able to improve on what I do from learning from these studios. So I, I think it's going to be a successful book. And yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting it out there. So I'm so fascinated by that. So you just basically like, was this like emails that you sent out to these various people? Did you call them? How did that go about? It was emails to ask if they'd be interested. And I got, I got, I got a lot of rejections too. And um, just because I was targeting, well, people who have a lot of, a lot of work on their plate. And this was a big undertaking for them as well, yeah. because in most of the cases it was, Skype interviews where I would record their calls and, and, and then transcribe the interviews after. Mm. And then once I transcribed the interview, I would edit it myself, send it back to them. They would make changes. It would come back to me. I would say, I would then put it into the book design format and then send them the PDF. They'd make more changes. And I would send it back to them. Is this okay? And then once that's okay, I would send the edited text to my edit to my editor, the publisher. They would make changes. It would come back to me. I would send that to the studio, and they would maybe make a few more changes. It would come back to me. So there's so much back and forth in, in making the book, um, which, yeah, logistically it can be a challenge. But you know, it, it was kind of the same with logo design love because there was a lot of studios involved in it. Right. So so I was kind of used to it. Uh, yeah, it's what you got to go through to make it, make a good book. I'm just fascinated because I'm thinking about doing something like that, even surrounding the podcast and stuff like that. So I was just curious how you went about doing that and just what the reception is like doing something like that when you know that you know it's for a book. The reception in terms of what the the like, designers at the studios yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Generally, they were excited about it. The ones that have come on board, they were really keen to be involved because, mm. you know, there have been about fifty thousand copies, more or less, of Logo Design Love sold. That's the English version, and then it's in about it's in twelve languages. So it's a good opportunity for the studios to, you know, get a bit of exposure for themselves as well. Not mm. that they need it because they're really respected names in themselves but you know you've always got to be thinking about where your next clients are going to come from and um, at the same time it's going to be really helpful for younger designers and, and people who are learning about the profession and that's one of the things that keeps me, me motivated is the yeah. fact that I can pass on what I've learned and help other people and if I can yeah make make a few royalties on a book at the same time then yeah all, all the better mm. nice I like that okay I'm not. I feel. I don't feel too. It's 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 possible. Now. It's possible because I literally yeah. wanted to do something like that, and um, just hearing um, how you explained it, how you went about it. So, how did you? Um, did the publishers reach out to you initially from the first book, and the relationship just kept going? That's right. That's right. Um, I received an email out of the blue in uh, as 2008 from my publisher at the time, um, Peach Pit which is a, a subdivision of uh, Pearson Education. And it was on the, the, the acquisitions editor, Nikki McDonald, was a great person to deal with. And 
she had seen my blog, Global Design Love, and then asked if I'd be interested in writing a book about the same topic. And it hadn't really crossed my mind at the time, but yeah, I thought, why not? Mm. And it was the same publisher that I worked with for my second book. Um, but this this third one is with Rockport. It's with a different publisher. And okay. that came about because publishers have access to the sales figures of all, of all books. Uh, I can't remember the name of the database. Um, mm. But uh, two or three publishers got in touch, sent me an email asking, would I be interested in writing a book with them? Um, and because I hadn't done one in a while uh, and because... I was less busy with clients at the time. I thought, yeah, why not? So the first thing to do was to put together a, a book proposal where I outline, it might just be a one page Word document where I outline the, the proposed title, subtitle, the content in terms of chapters and, and a bit about my background and how I might help to promote the book. Okay, cool, cool. So in, in, in forms of in like interview based wise, um, a book that's done like that, how did you come up with the chapters? Each chapter is essentially a studio. Oh, gotcha. So gotcha, gotcha. There's, there's the introduction that I wrote and then there are 16 chapters okay. and each chapter is a different design studio. Okay, okay, okay. Makes sense, makes sense. Wow, that's very fascinating. I could go into this deeper and deeper. This is very fascinating to me. Well, Daryl, if I can do it, you can do it. So, so <laughs> you, should, you should definitely, if it's what you want to do, go for it. I uh, appreciate it, man. I really appreciate it. So as we um, get ready to close in your, in your journey from starting out to now, um, what advice w would you give to creatives out there, what what would you have to, what, what knowledge would you want to pass down to them? Do it because it's what you most enjoy. That's what led me into a focus on logos and visual identity. And, and yeah, do, do the work that you want to do. If you're, if you're in a job that you're not quite sure about or if you find yourself wanting to do something different, even if it's not design, you know, just our lives, our lives are so short that you just gotta, you just gotta make up, you know, spend the time that you can doing what you most enjoy. If that's design, brilliant. If it's a particular niche of design, whether that's logos, websites, whatever, yeah, do that too. But don't find yourself wasting away all your hours in a job that you're living for the weekend, you know. I don't know. That's that. I don't know. It's probably fairly common advice, but yeah, if you can even only spend a, f a couple of hours a day or a couple of hours a week doing something that you enjoy, and that's your path into leaving what you're not so keen on, then start there. Because I know it's not easy for people to um, transition from one thing to another when you've got bills, mortgages, uh, kids, and all the rest of it. You know, you got pressures. So if if you're unhappy in what you're doing, one hour a week, start there, two hours a week, build it up. So it's one hour a day, two hours a day, you know, yeah, everyone starts somewhere and yeah, make the most of the time that you have. Love it, man. Love it. Love it. Well, David, um, where can people go to learn more about you? Uh, well, search David Airy, A-I-R-E-Y. <laughs> I've, I've spent my life spelling my surname, but um, yeah, that's that's it. Search, search for me. Uh, have a look at my website, Logo Design Love, Identity Designed. Um, yeah. That's All right. It. Well, David, I really appreciate you doing this. Um, this has been a blast. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks again for listening to this week's episode. I really appreciate you taking the time out. I hope, you know, you got something from it that it brought you value and, you know, you were able to pull something, some key tips, some key practices that can help you to take your career to the next level and just to elevate your mindset in general. Um, if you want to learn about everything that I'm doing, you can go to dpcreates.com. That's D as in dog, P as in Peter, creates.com. Or go to the podcast website that's passion behind 
theart.com. Thanks again for listening to this week's episode. Be blessed.